Is it reasonable to criticize the principle of falsifiability because this principle itself is not falsifiable? A common objection I hear when I criticize a specific pseudoscientific or metaphysical proposal and mention its lack of falsifiability is that the principle of falsifiability itself is not valid due to its own non-falsifiability. In this video, I want to discuss whether or not this is in fact a reasonable objection to one of the most quoted criteria for whether or not a specific theory or hypothesis can be classified as being scientific or not. The most notable philosopher to discuss the principle of falsification is without a doubt Karl Popper. It is therefore often in relation to him that this objection arises. The core of Popper's principle of falsifiability is to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. It is not to determine whether or not a specific theory is true or not, neither is it to determine the acceptability of a theory. It is quite obvious that science can make mistakes, and pseudoscience may happen to stumble upon the truth as well. The key question here is when we call something science. Popper basically argued that the empirical method is not sufficient in describing the scientific method. The empirical method, which is essentially inductive, proceeding from observation or experiment. An example of something that builds on a stupendous mass of empirical evidence based on observation is astrology. Astrology should naturally never be classified as a science. But why not? Instead of using the example of astrology, let us look at the examples that Popper himself used in his arguments. In the time of Popper, it was very different theories that made him question the conventional inductive approach to defining science. Freud's psychoanalysis and Alfred Adler's so-called individual psychology were theories that Popper did not fully accept as being scientific, on the grounds that they were essentially applicable to all psychological questions. Take, for example, a situation where a man throws a baby into a river with the intent of killing it, and another man saves the baby, thereby risking his own life. Each of these two cases can be explained with equal ease in Freudian and Adlerian terms. According to Freud, the first man suffered from repression, say, of some component of his Oedipus complex, while the second man had achieved sublimation. According to Adler, the first man suffered from feelings of inferiority, producing perhaps the need to prove to himself that he dared to commit some crime. And so did the second man, whose need was to prove to himself that he dared to rescue the child. We find ourselves in a situation where we wonder, is there any human behavior that cannot be explained in both Freudian and Adlerian terms? You could say that people supporting each of these theories would argue that this was indeed the strength of the theories. But instead of seeing this general applicability as a strength, it should rather be seen as a weakness, Popper argued. If we, on the other hand, take Einstein's theory of general relativity, we see that the situation is strikingly different. Einstein's gravitational theory had led to the result that light must be attracted by heavy bodies, such as the sun, precisely as the material bodies were attracted. As a consequence, it could be calculated that light from a distant fixed star whose apparent position was close to the sun would reach the earth from such a direction that the star would seem to be slightly shifted away from the sun. Or in other words, that stars close to the sun would look as if they have moved a little away from the sun and from one another. This is a thing that cannot normally be observed since such stars are rendered invisible in daytime by the sun's overwhelming brightness. But during an eclipse it is possible to take photographs of them. If the same constellation is photographed at night, one can measure the distance of the two photographs and check the predicted effect. Now the impressive thing about this case is the risk involved in a prediction of this kind. If observations show that the predicted effect is definitely absent, then the theory is simply refuted. The theory is incompatible with certain possible results of observation, in fact with results which everybody before Einstein would have expected. This is perhaps a slight oversimplification since some of the effect described by Einstein would have been observed with the classical ballistic theory of light. The important point is, though, that the strength of the theory lies in its vulnerability to failure rather than its general applicability. This is in essence the key thesis of what Popper said. Some important conclusions Popper made regarding his studies were It is easy to obtain confirmation or verification for nearly every theory if we look for confirmations. 
Confirmation should count only if they are the result of risky predictions. That is to say, if unenlightened by the theory in question, we should have expected an event which was incompatible with the theory, an event which would have refuted the theory. Every good scientific theory is a prohibition. It forbids certain things to happen. The more a theory forbids, the better it is. So, returning to the original question. Is it reasonable to criticize the principle of falsifiability because this principle itself is not falsifiable? Well, I guess it is, but it seems to be a fairly trivial point. Kind of like saying that Ted Haggard is a foppish, bigoted, gay-hating, hypocritical method, or that creation science has as much scientific merit as Governor Palin has political experience. Karl Popper was in the business of defining what a scientific theory was, and he seemed to solve the problem that philosophers refer to as demarcation, or how to draw the line between science and non-science. Although a simple solution to this problem might be desirable, it is reasonable to believe that the question is slightly more complex than anticipated by Popper. The principle of falsification is simply not a contender for a title as a scientific theory. This should be quite obvious for anyone at this point. More interestingly, why do people, mainly Christians, think this in the first instance? I think it is simply because they feel that the principle of falsification in some way refutes the idea of a god, or in some way makes it a less accepted theory. In actual fact, it says nothing about either. Common sense refutes the idea of a god, though. What they really should be worried about is how to examine the validity of their beliefs without simply confirming them on the grounds that they, in reality, are defined so weakly that any worldly event could be explained by the God hypothesis. Naturally, this is only a concern if you truly are interested in and prepared to change your mind and be rational. Until that day, pseudoscience, metaphysics and faith are ideas that are cursed to confirm themselves on no rational grounds until the end of time. Thank you for watching.